Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, May 9th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, as millions of students prepare to graduate, they'll be bombarded by liberal speakers at a rate of six for every one conservative. Then, what you need to know about Brexit. After that. Lovely. Austin! What have you done? That's not your mother, it's a man, baby! How will people react if someone of the wrong gender walks into the privy? And social media doubles down on steering public opinion. That's next. Well, you would think that they had all of the important issues solved, but we've got Obama and his attorney general Loretta Lynch having a news conference today talking about how they're going to sue the state of North Carolina. We'll get to the lynch mob and the gay KK in just a moment, but first I want to talk about what happened in London over the weekend. Breitbart reports that Muslims reading the advert are told that to, quote, gather the rewards of Ramadan, unquote, they must donate to Islamic Relief, an organization which had its accounts with banking giant HSBC closed after, quote, concerns that cash for aid could end up with terrorist groups abroad. Now, remember, we've reported multiple times about all the money laundering issues that HSBC has had with drug cartels, as well as with terrorist organizations. For them to close these accounts is troubling, especially considering the fact that the new mayor had questions about his relationships with different organizations during the campaign. Those were dismissed as simply racist. And so the question is, is London transitioning into Arabia? I mean, are they uh, trans-Islamic here? The new campaign came the day after London crowned its first Muslim leader, Mayor Sadiq Khan, and Islamic Relief. Again, remember, this is the organization that the central, that the large bank that has been involved in more money laundering, convicted of more money, money laundering issues than any other large bank, HSBC, suspended their account. Islamic Relief called it a nice irony. How about that? A nice irony that the two events coincided. Now, Breitbart points out that the phrase that's on here, glory to Allah, is often mistranslated as glory to God, in the same way that Allah Akbar is often translated as God is great, but it really means in Arabic, our God, Allah, is greater than yours. Now, this might just be a lot of people complaining because they don't like to see Islamic slogans on buses, right? No, the issue here is the fact that they have continually suppressed Christian groups putting the same kinds of religious uh, ads on buses. For example, they point out Christian groups fared less well with London buses. The then mayor, Boris Johnson, stepped in to ban a, a message by a Christian group in response to a pro-gay advertising campaign. A group called Stonewall told Londoners, some people are gay, get over it. Then there was a Christian group that came out and said, not gay, ex-gay, post-gay, and proud, get over it. Well, that message was shut down. It was challenged, but it was left to stand. It was not found to be unlawful. And then this one, which was even more interesting. Last November, the Church of England, the official church of the British government, we don't have an official church here in America, but they do in England, and it's supposed to be the Church of England, they decide they would do a commercial that they'll be shown in movie theaters about the Lord's Prayer. So they had a lot of people. It was a 62nd spot. They featured a farmer, a weightlifter, gospel singers, children, even the Archbishop of Canterbury, praying just before the new Star Wars film was going to open up, but it was banned by the different cinema chains. It was blocked by Digital Cinema Media, DCM, the agency that controls advertising for Britain's biggest cinema chains, including Odeon, View, and Cinema World. The Church of England call, called the decision chilling in terms of free speech. And so you have to ask yourself, is the real Church of England the state church, or is it a state mosque now? Because Islamic messages are allowed to be put on the buses, but Christian messages are suppressed. And you might say, well, you know, we don't want anybody coming after the homosexuals, okay? But look at what's happening with our allies, ISIS, Saudi Arabia. As Jonathan Turley points out, ISIS cleanses a gay man of sins by stoning him and then throwing him off the top of a building. This is not something new. This is something that happens all the time. But the left is swallowing a camel while they strain at a gnat. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. And they point out that within Sharia law, they say they can cleanse a man of his sins by this execution. This is the medieval system of Sharia law, as he points out. The Sharia faux court explained that throwing gays this way clean, cleanses their sins. 
And he also points out that our closest allies, Saudi Arabia, also use Sharia law. They use the death penalty. They criminalize homosexuality. Saudi prosecutors are reportedly seeking the death penalty for dozens of people right now who admit that they are homosexuals. Why do we work so closely with Saudi Arabia? As a matter of fact, why do we work so closely with ISIS? People are not admitting that we work with ISIS, but we have documented over and over again how the U.S. government, the CIA, via Turkey and other methods, have been supplying ISIS with weapons, just as we supplied al-Qaeda with weapons when they were called Mujahideen and also when they were called al-Qaeda as well. Well, of course, this brings it back to the missing 28 pages and the CIA director, John Brennan, saying that we're going to protect Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, we've got the Obama administration lobbying against releasing these pages, lobbying against the compensation bills that are going through the Congress that have overwhelming majority of people from both parties who say that if the Saudis were shown to be complicit in aiding uh, what they consider to be the uh, true narrative of this, that there were 19 hijackers that took this down. Of course, that's the official story. And as Senator Bob Graham has said, that could not have happened without help inside the United States. Of course, that's true. That's only one aspect of it. But if we're going to have that, we need to understand, if they're going to throw the Saudis under the bus, we need to understand that there needs to be some compensation for victims. But they don't want to do that. They don't want the story, the official conspiracy theory, to begin to unravel. And they don't want to pull back from their allies, the Saudis, even though they execute homosexuals. And yet the Obama administration will throw out this and, and stop the presses, have a massive press conference this afternoon. So the Attorney General Loretta Lynch, even though we have no other problems to solve. We don't have any problems with the border. We don't have any problems with national security and the violation of national security by the Secretary of State. No, the most important stop the presses press conference they had this afternoon, absolutely outraged and indignant that there would be bathroom laws in North Carolina. This is simply to divide and distract the country because this could have been handled any number of ways at either the city level, the state level, or the federal level to respect private property, to respect people's free choices. And yet, now we see today, we've got North Carolina first suing the Justice Department after they threatened to withhold federal funding for education. And then we have the feds countersuing North Carolina. And when I talk about the lynch mob and the gay KK, this is what the feds are saying. Attorney General Loretta Lynch compared House Bill 2 in North Carolina to Jim Crow laws. She says, this law provides no benefit to society all it does is harm innocent Americans. Well, I think both sides are saying that. And when we look at where this originally started, this, was, this began in Charlotte. We had an LGBT chamber president, and he stepped down after people learned of his sex offender status. We had a situation where nobody was telling anybody what to do with bathrooms other than saying you have to have this many stalls in a bathroom if you have this much square footage. Then you had the LGBT Chamber of Commerce in Charlotte come up with a law making new demands on people, not respecting people's private choices, not respecting their private property. At that point, the North Carolina state government had an opportunity to do something that was reasonable and say, you're not going to dictate to people what they can do with their private businesses, with their churches, but they didn't do that. Instead, the ball was in their court and they hit it back and came back in an attack mode. Now it has escalated to the feds, who have absolutely no authority to get involved in this under the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment. As the North Carolina lawsuit states, they said uh, this is simply a common sense bodily privacy law. Well, it should have been privacy and private property and the Tenth Amendment, but instead uh, they chose to escalate this. But what they are characterizing the moves by the federal government to be a radical reinterpretation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Governor McCrory blamed the city of Charlotte for raising the issue of gender identity in the first place. And of course, as I pointed out, it was from the LGBT group in Charlotte. He said the matter was not on the state's agenda until the city imposed a mandate that caused major privacy concerns about males entering female facilities and females entering male facilities. So they bounce this back and forth. And it's interesting, I think, to note that the guy who started all of this was Chad Severance Turner a man who is on a sex offender list because he was found guilty of fondling a 15-year-old teenage church member while the boy slept. This is the guy that began everything, that did not want to leave the status quo where it had been. And now we have the 
Justice Department, the so-called Justice Department, the lynch mob escalating this now, finding new rights, new ways to distract people from real issues. And here's another example. And I'm going to tell you how this plays into new rights that have been found. This is a case in Seattle of a grandmother, actually a great-grandmother. Uh, she's a grandmother of three and a uh, grandmother of eight and a great-grandmother of three. She's 80 years old. And she heard a noise in her house in Seattle, and she found their husband coming back towards her. He had been stabbed and hit with a crowbar. He told her what had happened. It was a home invasion. She ran to the back, got her 38, came out, shot and killed the home intruder. Now, she said that she felt like if she hadn't, her son and she, as well as her husband, would all be dead, uh, that her husband might have bled to death on the kitchen floor. She said, you know, never in my whole life did I ever anticipate having to take another life, especially at the age of 80. Authorities investigating the case believe that Shepard, the person shot, the person doing the home invasion, may have been looking for prescription drugs to steal when he was disturbed by the husband, Mr. Moles. Now, I've got to tell you, this reflects when I saw this very much on a personal story in my life. Uh, my aunt and uncle, back in 1986, were murdered not with a home intrusion, but with a renter that they rented to, someone that now we have Obama warning landlords that criminals have a right to rent. The individual that they rented to was a man who had been found guilty and served time for rape. Now, my aunt and uncle were very old at the time. They were in their 70s. There was no internet, of course, and of course, if there had been, they probably wouldn't have used it to check his background. But now Obama is telling landlords that criminals have a right to rent from you. You can't say, I'm not going to rent to this person because they're a violent felon, because they raped or killed somebody. I'm not going to uh, be allowed to discriminate against them because I might be sued. Well, let me tell you what happened to my aunt and uncle. Unfortunately, neither of them had a firearm. Now, they were both very poor. Uh, the amount of rent that this guy was behind was about $250, which represented several months' worth of rent. They lived in the same place. It was a duplex. Uh, he paid them the rent and then came back later in the night, very angry, broke into the apartment and butchered both of them to the extent that the person who was reading the, uh, describing the case, the police lieutenant broke down on the stand. And as I think about Mother's Day and what my cousins have to remember how their parents left this world, and I look at what Obama is doing with these laws, I have to say, this is the kind of insanity that we see, discovering these new rights and telling us that we have to put our lives in danger because the Obama administration and their Justice Department, which is now down in Charlotte, is telling us, well, we think that we have committed uh, to prison, found guilty, a larger percentage of black people and Hispanics, and so therefore, we're not going to let you discriminate against felons. Well, if that's the case, if they put these people away simply because they're black or Hispanic, that should be something we should reform with the Justice Department, and that may very well be the case. However, they're the ones who found them guilty. They're the ones who put them in jail. They're the ones who identified them as dangerous individuals, and conduct is not something that we cannot discriminate against. As a matter of fact, conduct is something that we must discriminate against. Our lives are at stake. I don't wanna see this happen to anybody else, what happened to my family, and yet we have the Obama administration saying that if you refuse to rent to somebody who is a convicted criminal, then they can sue you. And guess what? The person that is putting this out is HUD Secretary Julian Castro, one of the people who is now in the Veep stakes for Hillary Clinton. He and his brother, his brother is uh, mayor in San Antonio, they are brushing up on their Spanish. The two of them are the spawn of a Chicano activist who has turned them into revolutionaries, and now they would like to be vice president of this country. His organization, HUD, says that landlords may be allowed to bar those with criminal records from living in a facility, but they have to prove that such a policy is necessary for protecting the safety of other tenants, and it's designed to avoid illegal discrimination. Yeah, there you go. So you, the burden of proof is on you, even though the government says that they have proved these are violent individuals. And along the same line, look at what has happened in Virginia with Terry McAuliffe, a guy who has been nothing but a political operative for the Clintons, for the DNC, 
He is now governor of Virginia, having had no experience in anything other than those types of politics. This is the same guy who a few months ago, along with his Democrat attorney general, decided that they were going to revoke the carry permits from about 25 states, if I remember correctly, uh, saying they were not going to have reciprocity. Now they're going to, after they reject people's ability to carry weapons to protect themselves, after they tell us that we have to have convicted felons in our rental property, now they're going to tell us that they want these same felons to be able to vote. And they're going to restore their voting rights for 206,000 ex-felons in Virginia, and we know what that's, what's behind that, don't we? Now, the people in the Virginia legislature who pushed back on this open carry permit uh, issue and got them to back down from that are also saying, you cannot restore these voting rights in a blanket manner. That is against the law in Virginia. But when has something being against the law ever stopped the Hillary Clinton Democrats? Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> yeah! Score! Goal! Goal! <laughs> Welcome back. Joining me now is Leanne McAdoo, and we're here to talk about what's going on with Facebook. Are they really honestly portraying the trending stories, or are they rigging it? You know, we're told, Leanne, that, uh, or at least we're left with the impression, this is something that's being done honestly, uh, without the intervention of humans, maybe, you know, implied that it's being done by an algorithm, and yet whistleblowers are telling us that's not what happened at all, right? Right, absolutely. And, and, you know, this is no surprise to us. We've been talking for years about our articles being suppressed. People are trying to share uh, some InfoWars articles on Facebook and they're not able to or some someone will post something um, anti Hillary Clinton and Facebook will determine that it's uh, violates their terms of service. Meanwhile, you can keep a assassinate Donald Trump page up there mm -hmm. for and it's completely fine. No violation right. of service. Well, now we do have some former Facebook workers. They were all employed as contractors and they came out saying we routinely suppressed conservative news mm -hmm. and it was all just willy-nilly based on whoever was on the shift that day if they felt like something was newsworthy they could inject it into the trending news or if it right. was it didn't uh, have to be trending according exactly. to algorithms they could take a story that they wanted to promote and stick it in there mm -hmm. a story that was trending that they didn't agree with they could pull out and of course Zuckerberg has been very outspoken about his globalist beliefs and attacking Donald Trump and many other issues that he's very outspoken about. So it's not a surprise that they would do this. Right. And we've seen this kind of across the board, um, whereas you speak with algorithm, we know that Google's algorithm is so important, it can crush companies entirely. And it's the same with them. It's not just some arbitrary algorithm. There are actually people in there that you can call and say, hey, you know, what's going on here? Same with Facebook. And so they have omitted conservative topics from their trending list. Meanwhile, they made the Black Lives Matter movement trend by the inserting it into the newsfeed because it wasn't trending and people were saying, well, hey, this is really important. You should make this go viral. And so they did. And then, of course, you know, you hear in the media how powerful Black Lives Matter is in social media, but it's not because the whole system is rigged because it suits a certain agenda. And even before this broke with the whistleblowers, we'd seen indications that, of course, this was going on. Mm -hmm. You had in the question and answer periods, it was put in there, hey, should we uh, spike Trump or should we attack Trump? What should we do to take this guy down <laughs> is one of the questions. And, right. Uh, they Facebook had an inner, I guess they do like an inner office poll there every mm -hmm. single week. And that was one of their actual polls that they have between the employees. It said, suspicious. Specifically, what responsibility does Facebook have to help prevent President Trump in 2017? Responsibility. That's their responsibility that they have as this business who is trying to put themselves out there as this non-biased news aggregator. Come see, to that's Facebook. that's the problem I have, is, is that when people put themselves out there as being non-biased, you have to understand that either they're not being honest with themselves about their own biases, or they're being very dishonest with you because everybody has biases. What right. you choose to report, the analysis that you give it, that's why I always prefer to get my news from a source that 
was upfront about its biases. Okay, right. I would like to go to opinion journals that were conservative or libertarian or liberal. Even I would go to Mother Jones or whatever and say, well, you know, what are the progressive socialists saying about right. this? I would like to see the clash of ideas and people who are upfront and honest about what those ideas are, rather than hiding right. uh, their uh, agenda and opinion, because it eventually comes out. It yeah. eventually comes out. You can tell it in the what they say about things, what they cover, uh, or you can see it when you've got whistleblowers. Who what does or does not violate their terms of service. And so Mikhail Thalen uh, talked about this on the 4th of May, that these contractors say that they choose what is trending. They're known as the news curators, but they, they come out and they say that they were treated like robots. They were there basically to interact with this algorithm. And so we're sort, sort of starting to see the people training their replacements in these AI mm -hmm. um, operations here. But so because it's important for people to understand that just because it's an algorithm, just because it's a robot that's doing it, doesn't mean that it isn't rigged completely. Yeah. I mean, they can they can hard bake that in and make it more obvious than they can with a human who's coming in who will blow the whistle on them. The software isn't going to blow the whistle on this, okay? <laughs> they can rig it just like they rig elections. Yeah. Well, and of course, it's going to start to see that specific topics are continually suppressed. And then so that's how it learns, okay, well, these topics, these websites aren't important, and I should never allow these things to start trending. So it starts to learn from the human who's teaching it, don't don't give any attention to these conservative points of view. Mm -hmm. um, so you have news sites such as the Drudge Report, Breitbart, Newsmax, Washington Examiner, and of course, Infowars. And so what they were forced to do is if we had a breaking story come out, they would have to wait until a, an establishment media source like the New York Times or something reported on it as well. And then they would they would post it from that establishment site. Mm -hmm. And they say- And take their spin. We'd have to ch choose the one that had the least amount of bias. But yeah. it's if it's liberal bias, totally fine. So if you somebody take our story, water it down, spin it, misrepresent it, and label it a conspiracy theory, then they would link to that. And of course, you don't have to have something that is AI, that is uh, learning heuristically about this. You can just put a filter in there and say, hey, you know, if it matches these terms or if it matches these websites, spike it. Right, exactly. And so, you know, Facebook does have a political agenda, as we can see there, even with that poll that they took, should they stop a Trump campaign? But one of the things that they say that they the curators didn't ever suppress anything that had Facebook. If, it, if the news was about Facebook, they wouldn't. So they said that um, they were censoring content that was undermining Zuckerberg's immigration agenda. They said that was just an error. We didn't mean to suppress that. So what was happening, obviously he was very much behind immigration with the whole Muslim thing, the H-1B worker visas. And so a lot of people were trying to post uh, stories and studies using government data job reports showing how mass migration has impacted the U.S. labor market, things that were very contradictory and made the whole political agenda that he was pushing look bad. Those were suppressed, mm -hmm. but it was an error, mm -hmm. right? And so this is how you can see how it can uh, sway an election or get a lot of young people or even people in the community thinking that, oh, well, all of my friends are really behind this topic because it's trending. So maybe I should also think like this and do that. Or maybe I shouldn't speak out about how I feel or what I'm really passionate about because it's not what's trending or it's not what all of my friends are into, you know? So it's right. they're completely controlling the narrative. Well, of course, in the past, you used to have the three major networks and they would determine the news and they would basically essentially all cover the same stories, give you the same angle on that. Uh, now, as things begin to open up, we have to have a way for the establishment to take back the narrative. Mm -hmm. And of course, putting this out there and saying, oh, we're gonna let all of you organically share the articles that you think are interesting. You can like these things and put them out there and you're just going to find out, you know, it's just gonna bubble up to the top. Well, that has happened to some degree in the past. They're gonna shut that down, take it over. That's going to be the facade, but they will, if they can, confine everybody to Facebook and Google and a couple of other uh, points of control, then they can control the narrative again, just like they did when they had just three networks giving everybody the news. Right. And that's what we have now. Uh, re regulators in Washington, of course, are really afraid of the new media arguing that it's too powerful. So they want to put out these new regulations. But of course, Facebook doesn't fall under the new media because it's gotten in line with the globalist agenda. Mm -hmm. But they see that they, these dissonant voices out there can speak out and have a lot of powerful influence. But it's, it's really dangerous because people don't understand how much the conservative viewpoint, even though the majority of Americans are conservative, mm -hmm. it's so suppressed that they, 
that they start to believe that this is actually how the world is thinking. And that's it's not reality. So you see all these kids in school who are trying to silence any conservative speakers from coming in. It's like, I think, six to one as far as liberal people who will come speak at your school versus conservatives. And now it's getting to the point where campus protesters are barring the door and setting off the fire alarm and doing everything they can to stop any conservative voices from even going on their campus. So well, because I would say that Zuckerberg everywhere. is not even conservative, he's globalist. Right. He's made it very clear, he's drawn very clearly the lines between globalism and nationalism, between uh, the multinational corporations first or America first. And what he does is, the way he fights that war, is to label everything that he's opposed to as racist right. or uh, you know, anti-woman or whatever. They've got all their little pigeonholes that they put everybody into. They essentially amount to ad hominem attacks on individuals or on groups. Right. Well, it definitely seems to be finally backfiring because the curtain has been peeled back and people can see that they're using racism or whatever as this tool to silence and oppress people. That's and good. it's, you know. Well, we're going to take a break, a real quick break, and then we're going to be back with Darren McBreen and Joe Biggs, and they're going to show us what this looks like physically in the world. They went to a Trump rally this weekend in Oregon, and they're gonna show us and tell us what they saw there. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Hillary Clinton's days are numbered, or so it would appear. During the past few weeks, the FBI has dragged in Hillary's assistant, Huma Abedin, and Brian Pagliano, the IT specialist believed to have set up and maintained Clinton's server. Pagliano was given full immunity in exchange for his help with the investigation, an investigation narrowing down the correct answers to questions surrounding the emails on Hillary's private server deemed confidential that placed national security at a high level of risk while Hillary made a mockery of the U.S. Secretary of State office. By the way, you may have seen that I recently launched a Snapchat account. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Those messages disappear all by themselves. As the investigation appears to wind down, Hillary will be interviewed by the FBI in a matter of days or weeks. Regarding the answers the FBI now has to questions that must be corroborated by Hillary, the FBI and the Justice Department have denied any knowledge of whether or not the investigation is closing or whether or not Hillary is the target of the investigation. But The Hill reports, Stephen Levin, a former federal prosecutor and current partner at the law firm Levin and Curlett, said, This certainly sends the signal that they are nearing an end to their investigation. Typically, the way we structured the investigations when I was a federal prosecutor is that we would seek to interview the target last. Stephen Levin continues, As you begin to interview people who are extremely close to the target of an investigation, people who are considered confidants, you typically interview those people towards the final stages of the investigation. So that way, if they tell you something that is contrary to something you've already learned, you can immediately challenge them on that information. Tech activist Marcel Lazar, a.k.a. Guccifer, claims to have breached Hillary's server at least twice. Guccifer said he first compromised Clinton confidant Sidney Blumenthal's AOL account in March of 2013 and used that as a stepping stone to the Clinton server. He said he accessed Clinton's server, like, twice, though he described the contents as not interesting to him at the time. Doodles by Bill Clinton appear to back up Guccifer's claims that were released as far back as 2013. It bears repeating the extent to which Hillary violated her position in the State Department, because most people have become completely accustomed to corruption as business as usual. Here are the facts. As the nation's chief diplomat, Hillary Clinton was responsible for ascertaining whether information in her possession was classified and acknowledged that negligent handling of that information could jeopardize national security, according to a copy of an agreement she signed upon taking the job. A day after assuming office as Secretary of State, Clinton signed a sensitive compartmented information non-disclosure agreement that laid out criminal penalties for any unauthorized disclosure of classified information. The sensitive, compartmented information non-disclosure agreement details how Hillary has been granted access to sensitive, compartmented information, or SCI, 
classified information. The agreement states that Hillary hereby acknowledges that the disclosure of SCI may constitute violations of United States criminal laws and that nothing in the agreement constitutes a waiver by the United States of the right to prosecute for any statutory violation. The agreement is also severable, meaning if one part is unenforceable, the remainder of the provisions in the agreement remain in full force and effect. Bottom line, U.S. intelligence officials determined at least four and up to 305 of the emails Hillary's aides printed out were from Hillary's personal server and were SCI at the time they were written. Two of the emails discussed classified drone information deemed top secret by the CIA. Hillary Clinton faces 10 years behind bars as required under the Espionage Act. Jeffrey Sterling, a CIA leak, was sentenced to three and a half years after disclosing national defense information concerning a covert operation. And General David Petraeus was slapped with two years probation and a fine of $100,000 for revealing classified documents to his mistress. Petraeus, a former director of the CIA, a four-star general, and CENTCOM commander, had served our country for 37 years. So why would Hillary Clinton deserve immunity? Ignorance and or negligence of Hillary's possession of highly sensitive, classified emails is no joke. In fact, if Hillary does walk away from this investigation with a slap on the wrist after she personally went to great lengths to cover up a mountain of evidence, the entire farce will demonstrate just how far gone the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Justice Department really are. Hillary's path of deception could even serve to take those departments to the cleaners if Donald Trump becomes president and keeps his word. John Bound for Infowars.com. Joining me now are Darren McBreen and Joe Biggs, our InfoWars reporters. They went to Eugene, Oregon this weekend to cover the massive Trump rally. And we've got a video compilation coming up in the next segment. But I wanted them to give us their firsthand uh, impressions of what they saw there. Darren? Well, my, my biggest impression was what you're going to see is the bad part of Eugene, Oregon. And that's all the anti-Trump agitators. But keep in mind, inside, there was what, 5,000 capacity crowd, so there was 5,000 pro-Trump people in there, very good Americans, very patriotic, people of all color, by the way. We saw a, a Muslim for a Trump supporter. Uh, we saw some black gentlemen, uh, Latinos, but, you know, the crowd, you know, kids, it was a really good family gathering. Full capacity, 5,000, they had to turn people away. Meanwhile, on the outside, were the agitators and they surrounded most of the exits and blocked the pro-Trump supporters inside and wouldn't let them out. <laughs> and about and how it many got, of them? It got pretty ugly. <laughs> well, they're all sitting there like, oh, you know, we're, we're here to stop hate while cursing and spitting mm -hmm. and, and threatening violence as, you know, husbands and their wives and their little children are yep. like scared, shaking, walking through this like, group of people just hurling insults at him. You're an effing racist or a black guy with a Trump shirt on. You're an Uncle Tom. And there's all this Well, we stuff. just had the former governor of Pennsylvania, who's going to chair the Democrat National Convention, say, we're going to have a process where we're going to put Bernie in nomination. There's going to be a speech, a vote. He's going to lose. And the Bernie Sanders supporters need to behave themselves. Now, why would he say that? He knows <laughs> it's not the Trump people's fault, right? No. He, he knows because he's seen all of these things. It's a common... Uh, everybody knows that this has happened. It's happened at all these different rallies, and it's only when they want to use it to political advantage, when the Democrats want to use it against Trump and his supporters, or when somebody like Ted Cruz wants to blame Trump and his supporters for the violence. Well, they know which side the violence is coming from. Something I never thought would come out of Rachel Maddow's mouth was the truth. And she goes, <laughs> these crazed Bernie supporters are going to Hillary Clinton events and attacking uh, yeah. the Clinton supporters, but they yeah. still don't ever mention the fact that the thousands that show up to these Trump protests and incite violence and become violent. And then when they push someone to the limit, are shocked when they when they get pushed or punched, and then they want to play the victim when they're the ones coming out there right. and making that happen. I mean, well, and that's the thing right there is there's these anti-Trump agitators. I don't like calling them protesters because they're really they're rioters and, mm -hmm. and agitators. If you look around, uh, there's all kinds of flags. Not one American. Not one American flag. But yeah. you'll see La Raza, you'll see Mecca, you'll see, uh, you know, the Mexican flags, every flag you can think of, communist flags, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. I, was I was just going to say, sorry, they're so stupid that they don't even realize they're paving the way for a Trump presidency. Right That's right. Because That's right. people are seeing this and, and it's... it's like like Vincente Fox, right. he goes and has a powwow with Nancy Pelosi on how they can stop Trump. 
Or you got all these other leaders from other countries saying, we've got to stop Trump. And it's like, how do they think that's playing? I mean, I, mean, I was surprised helping. by the amount of pro La Raza protesters or whatever. In Eugene, they were in Oregon. Eugene, Oregon. What the heck, man? There was, a lot, it, it, huh? there was at least mm -hmm. 400 of these guys sitting there chanting, Viva La Raza, La Raza, let's put an end to uh, white supremacy, stop white hate. And, and meanwhile, you know, they've got their Mexican flags. There's nothing about America whatsoever in it. And they're saying that they want a part of their, you know, their freedom. They, they want to be able to do this and that. Not once, though, did I ever see an American flag except on a Hispanic guy. He had an American flag draped around his neck. You saw him, right? Oh, and they, he was, and they all jumped around him. You're a traitor to your yeah. race. You're garbage, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, they, they, they don't want to be a part of America. No. They don't want to make America great. Like that sign that little kid was holding that, that Drudge had at the top uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, make America Mexican again. Yeah. Okay. And we that's what a lot of those do. A lot of those signs were there as well. Yeah. Wow. So stick around for the video, folks. It's coming up right after this break. You don't want to miss it. We're getting uh, some heated arguments and tensions are running high right after this. Stick around. Infowars.com. Here we are outside the Trump rally. Eugene, Oregon. Lots of protesters have arrived. And Donald Trump should be speaking inside any moment now. And I'm telling you, the real fireworks will begin once that Trump rally is over and the Trump supporters are let out and they have to face this angry mob. Trump. Donald Trump. It's interesting to walk behind some of the, the people that are wearing Trump t-shirts or Trump hats and, 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 and see how they're treated by the protesters. This guy right here, for example, he's got a Trump shirt. That's how he's... This one little punk just threw a bunch of confetti at a guy with a Trump shirt. It might hurt, you know, with a paper. God damn, you know, God damn. Yeah, there's another. So you think it's appropriate that he throws stuff at people? I don't know what his uh, reason was. Okay. Obviously, yeah. he's frustrated about something. This guy's having a good time. It looks like Trump's not feeling so well. <laughs> You don't want to, right? You can't swim, huh? Okay, so I think he's making uh, comments of this because this is a Mexican guy with the American flag, and he's a pro-Trump supporter, so he's getting some angry looks from anti-Trump agitators. Trump. So. Bro, we were just inside right now. We got kicked out. Everybody was being violent towards us. Down with Trump. Down with Trump, bro. And just for saying down with Trump. So you said down with Trump. They kicked you out. Down with Trump. Everybody, everybody went towards us. They were like, get out. Knocking off our hats. All right, all right. You heard it here, folks. They shouted down with Trump at a private event. They were kicked out of a private event. Hey, nice shirts. Look at that right there. Look at that. Two, three, five, Hey, guys, what's the flag represent? It's uh, anarcho-syndicalism slash uh, communism. Okay, are you guys Bernie supporters? I'm not. I'm with this guy. But you don't like Donald Trump? Yeah, no. That's no. What, what, what's uh, your main deal? What's, what's the main thing you don't like about the Don? About the Donald Trump. Um, that's a tough question, but mainly because I guess he's just an asshole. Hey, put this on the front page of InfoWars. I'd like to take a shout out to all my friends. Um, first off, Alex Jones, I think you're a fucking traitor gay to the frogs. liberty movement. Gay frogs, gay uh, frogs, gay <laughs> frogs. Hey, we have a gay frog supporter over here. I support gay frogs. I'm racist. Yeah, you are. Why am I racist? You like Trump. Oh my that's God, why. It's in Donald Trump. Why, why is this young man racist for wearing a Donald Trump shirt? Because Trump is a racist, xenophobic, 
Islamic hating, Mexican hating. Wow, I've never heard that before. Okay, Where so did you hear that? Did you hear that like off the internet? Uh, or? That's what he says. Oh yeah. Yeah, he says that stuff. Just point oh. out. What did What did he say? Naughty. That kind of looks like. Oh no. yeah, it's wow. not. It's a shirt, and I'm allowed that, to wear it. This is a shirt too. Yeah, He's and also allowed doesn't. To wear yeah, but it means he supports someone that's a terrible human being. And why do you say that? I mean, because Trump is a terrible human being, and that's the end of the discussion. Do you see Trump supporters going to like Bernie Sanders rallies and uh, harassing Bernie Sanders uh, voters? You know, if they're wimps and they're scared and they have no don't balls, that's not our problem. He's you know? not worth your time. Don't talk to this man. He's not worth your time. No, but they would no, like no, no. They guys not worth your time. They like He is not worth your time. He's an idiot. Let's agree. Do not agree. I'm an idiot. Why am I an idiot? Trump. Floor out in the water supply, boy. Why am I an idiot? F that nigga Trump. Oh, All right. Hey, it's that gang shit. Gang shit. Trump. Gang shit. Gang shit. Gang shit. Gang shit. So obviously, this behavior is only paving the way for a Donald Trump presidency. These guys are too stupid to know it. Hey, you think he can get beat up for wearing that around here? Oh, hell yeah, absolutely. Without it. So if, just for wearing a shirt, though? Oh, absolutely. That game. Straight up. You hate, you're afraid of Mexican people. You're afraid of anybody other than the I white man. Like two you're, you're just fearful. You're afraid of things. That's you're why you're, you're making some pretty judge, big judgments when yeah. you don't know anybody here. I know what you're, I know what you're voting for. The police have announced that they are getting ready to let the people who have attended Trump's rally, they're going to let them out of the parking lot. And the anti-Trump protesters have gathered here, I guess, to harass them when they come out. No justice, no peace. 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 Uh, we got a significant development right here. Once again, this is InfoWars. Darren McBrain outside the Trump rally in Eugene, Oregon. The police have just told pedestrians to clear the area so the Trump supporters attending the Trump rally could leave. But now we have protesters that have blocked the gate. They have blocked the gate. And I guess they're trapping them inside. Let me let me back up. No, there's four exits. Don't worry. Let me back up. Trump's a Nazi. Good. Trump uses lime wire. There is four exits, however, so Trump doesn't. I guess they'll have to find another way to get out. And this is probably a blessing in disguise because if they had to drive through this area, more than likely they would spit on, had their cars keyed, egged. You know, we've seen it before in Costa Mesa. And you're watching InfoWars coverage of the anti-Trump protest outside the Trump rally in Eugene, Oregon. Well, they have blocked the gate. Come through, guys. Police are saying clear the roadway for so the vehicles could exit the premises. And they're also going over to the other fucking side and blocking those. There's no right. other exits, dude. Chill right. out. Hey, hey, why don't you chill out, all right? Because they're blocking an exit, I'm man. I'm just saying, you're it's recording people. something and you're lying to people. No, I'm not lying to the people. Are, I told them. I told the them there's, there's four exits. Are they blocking this exit? Are they blocking this exit? Eh. 